I'd like to answer a few questions that I've received about my book. Uh, but before I do that, just a quick disclaimer, after all, I am a lawyer. Uh, some friends who've read my book have told me that in reading it, they could almost hear me talking to them. So here's the disclaimer. If you don't like the way I talk, uh, you may well not like the book. Uh, they also told me that I, I still have a very weird sense of humor, and what I'll try and do in this uh, video is to give you a glimpse into that sense of humor. Again, uh, if you don't like it, I wouldn't buy, <laughs> I wouldn't buy the book. Um, so, before I get into what made me write the book, let me just give you a brief background of myself. Uh, I am a South African. No, I don't have an accent. Uh, you may, I don't. Uh, I practice law in South Africa. I've lived in London, uh, Zurich, Paris. I studied in Montreal at the McGill Law School before arriving in Los Angeles about 30 years ago. This all sounds very glamorous. If you think it's glamorous, that's cool. It really wasn't. But um, I uh, formed my own law firm with a good friend and later became the CEO of an international music company and the CEO of an international architectural design company and basically traveled the world um, negotiating deals. And if I gained any expertise over this time, it was probably in uh, negotiating deals um, and helping my clients uh, avoid some bad ones. So enough about me. So why did I write the book? Well, there were a few dots that I connected along the way which ultimately uh, resulted in me writing the book. The first dot uh, was when I was reminded about a question I was asked when I first arrived in Los Angeles some 30 years ago. I was asked by a foreign client what the difference was between doing business in different parts of the world and doing business in Los Angeles. And I said to them that what I would tell them might make them smile, but it was the absolute truth. And what I told him was this. I said to them, in London or Johannesburg or Sydney or Hong Kong or wherever, when somebody told you they had the rights to a widget, for example, it generally meant uh, they had the rights to the widget. In Los Angeles, when somebody tells you that they have the rights to the widget, it can mean one of at least three things, if not more. The first is, I think I know the guy who has the rights to the widget. Or two, I know somebody who went to school with someone whose roommate knows who has the rights to the widget. Or three, my mother plays bridge with somebody who has a friend who has a girlfriend who went to school with somebody who has a roommate who knows somebody who thinks he knows who has the rights to the widget. Of course, they're all lying outrageously, but they don't want to lose the opportunity of potentially being part of the deal. And that made me think of the scams where there was more outrageous lying. And as I looked at the scams, um, I realized that scams, the scammers were incredibly effective negotiators. They were able to persuade their marks to do pretty much whatever they wanted. And I realized that a scam was really just a negotiating duel between the scammers and their marks. And as I did that, I connected yet another dot because I thought of Nelson Mandela and his absolutely historic negotiations with the South African government. And you didn't have to be a South African, incidentally, to fully appreciate what he had done. So I figured if a scam's a negotiating duel, why not learn about negotiation from the best of the best, but not just as a series of rules? Why not really figure out how the guy developed those skills and used them? And that took me to the next dot that I connected, which was Nelson Mandela's moral authority, because what was absolutely clear from anybody uh, looking at the scams is that the leaders of the scam companies had no moral authority. There was nobody up there that simply said, we will not put up with this you know, outrageous stuff that's going on here. So the idea was to try and figure out how Nelson Mandela established that incredible um, moral authority. The next dot, and probably the clincher that made me write this book, is that when I did a little research into Enron, I discovered this unusual connection 
between Enron and Nelson Mandela. I discovered, for example, that Enron had awarded Nelson Mandela its highest prize for distinguished public service. Previous recipients were Mikhail Gorbachev and uh, Colin Powell. But I couldn't help but smile when I realized that they had awarded him a prize for the very qualities they didn't have and that could have saved their company. It was self-delusion at its best, and of course self-delusion is what the scammers really need of us. But it wasn't just Enron that was in a state of self-delusion. I discovered a few months before Enron had awarded Nelson Mandela his prize, Harvard had awarded Nelson Mandela an honorary doctorate, honoring him for the very qualities it had failed to teach Enron executives and alumni, including Ken Lay. And then George W. Bush, I discovered, had awarded him a, a Congressional Medal recognizing him for his diplomatic efforts. At the very time the President was being widely ridiculed for his own diplomatic efforts prior to the Iraq War. And finally, President Clinton had awarded Mandela the Congressional Medal of Honor or some such medal, uh, honoring him, amongst other things, for his moral authority. And this at a time the President was involved in the Monica Lewinsky uh, deal. I, I couldn't have possibly have made this up. This was a gift that kept on giving. And that sort of persuaded me uh, into writing the book, that we have this incredible capacity for self-delusion. And the next thing that was probably the total clincher was in connection with the business scams particularly. It was impossible to avoid the conclusion that we are living in a cheating culture where cheating is permitted on a wide scale in a wide number of different areas. And most remarkable of all, which continues to absolutely boggle my mind, is that while the business schools are being asked to better equip their students as our future business leaders um, to avoid a repetition of the Enron debacle and WorldCom debacles and many others, that there was more cheating amongst business students at these schools than any other students. And the deans knew about it, the schools knew about it, and here we have this incredible situation of the schools turning out alumni who are used to cheating, where cheating seems to be okay. So it struck me that we are in enormous peril, that we can't afford to trust anybody anymore because the very people on whom we rely to alert us to the scams are themselves the product of a cheating environment. It's absolutely astounding. So what I decided to do was to look at Nelson Mandela's negotiating skills and moral authority and track his life and see how he developed those skills and that authority and how he applied them. In the course of doing that, I extrapolated 10 powers of negotiation from Nelson Mandela. Why powers? Because knowledge is power, and if you know about this kind of stuff, you're in really good shape to detect and avoid the scams. And I also came up with the concept of the duck school, which is what I've called the school of common sense. Looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, we might just be looking at a duck. So what I then did is I um, took what I had learned and applied them to three modern adventures, the Enron scam, the Ahmed Chalabi scam, and uh, the Bernard Madoff scam. And the conclusion I reached was that if we had only applied Nelson Mandela's approach to those three adventures, we would never have been surprised at what actually happened. And in each case, the uh, comparison between what happened and the, en and the uh, Emperor's New Clothes was astounding. In each case, the scammers were selling nothing. Uh, Enron, that was the case. Chalabi, the weapons of mass destruction that he sold, didn't exist. And in Bernard Madoff, he didn't do a single transaction, didn't transact a single transaction. So anyway, um, finally, uh, the title of my book has caused a bit of a stir among some because they couldn't understand what the hell it meant. The book is called Detecting the Scam, Nelson Mandela's Gift, which I thought was fairly obvious. 
Nelson Mandela has provided us with a gift, the means by which we can identify and detect the scam. And it's only by applying his negotiating skills and understanding the power of moral authority that we can do that. Now, nowhere in my book do I make the claim that all scams are detectable or preventable. They're not. The sole idea here is that by using the tools that Nelson Mandela has given us, we simply stand a better chance of identifying and detecting the scams and avoiding them. So, I hope this has helped uh, explain a little bit about the book, and uh, I hope it hasn't dissuaded you from, from buying one. Thank you.